you don't, you won't lose them. Permanently. All right, if you, uh, <laughs> you, you can okay. all finish chewing whatever you're chewing and uh, uh, good afternoon. I, it's my pleasure to moderate uh, this exceptional uh, luncheon conversation uh, on the United States and global missile defense. Uh, we had a great morning uh, uh, with Jim Miller, the European Phase uh, Adaptive Approach, Gulf of the Middle East. Um, I think we really see the value in this uh, conference of having taken it global because there really are interconnections that uh, if, we, if we don't discuss them, we're just missing it. So the uh, goal of this session is to have a broader outlook of U.S. global missile defense ambitions, but really to take a strategic view. Assess where we are in the technology very quickly assess where we are fiscally very quickly, but then, uh, uh, then very quickly get into the, qu the questions of global missile defense architectures, uh, how this can be a driver for collaboration, how it should look in Asia, how it should look in, in the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, et cetera. Um, uh, and I can't imagine two people I'd rather be sitting with up here uh, than Ellen Tauscher and Steve Hadley. Uh, both the executive committee members of the Atlantic Council board. Um, we've heard from Ellen uh, briefly this morning. Uh, I just want to reiterate how happy we are to have had you as the chair of this Endeavor conference. My pleasure. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just quickly, for the record, repeat uh, a couple of her uh, uh, previous positions. Uh, in 2007, uh, you spoke on third site missile defense as a member of Congress from California's 10th District and chair of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Uh, at that point, you were not in total agreement with Steve Hadley's administration, Steve Hadley, the, the, the George W. Bush we administration. We were in complete agreement about missile defense. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tee you up on that in just a second. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, in 2009, representing the Obama administration, Under Secretary of State for International Security and Arms Control. <laughs> Um, uh, Ellen has really something I think is quite unique, which is a strategic mind in two respects, both in terms of understanding the domestic politics of trying to get something done, but also understanding the strategic context of, of missile defense, so we really look forward to that. Um, and, uh, and as you all know, uh, Steve Hadley, um, as National Security Advisor, uh, but what many in the audience may not know quite as well is as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs, you oversaw policies on nuclear weapons, ballistic missile defense, arms control. You also served as U.S. Defense Department's representative in talks that resulted in START I and, and START II treaties. So I can't uh, imagine a better mixture of capabilities here with us right now and also I think you underscore the bipartisan nature of the Atlantic Council, Republican, a Democrat, uh, working uh, to find the best solutions uh, to America's national security interests and the security interests of our allies and friends around the world. So let, maybe just to start, um, you can briefly recap for the audience, uh, Ellen, maybe you can begin, uh, your previous relationship over missile defense. As I say, you didn't always agree on all the details of it, but you seem to have, uh, have been of a common mind on the necessity. Well, <clears throat> in the Bush administration, uh, let's see, I came to the Congress in 97, uh, President Bush came in in 2000, and um, you know, Steve and, and, and his predecessor, <coughs> Um, Condi Rice, uh, you know, after 9-11, you know, many of us were coming over to the White House quite regularly, and uh, I was, I had known of Steve, I had not known him personally, but, um, you know, we were certainly in a time I wish we could return to where there were no partisan issues. We were all Americans and deeply concerned about our country, and, um, you know, it was a relief for me not only to have a Californian and Dr. Rice in such a prominent position, but to get to know Steve. And we, I think we worked really well together on many different issues. Uh, 
including uh, Homeland Security, creating that department. But for me, on the Armed Services Committee, you know, it was a, it was a very important opportunity. And you know, we have bipartisan support in the Congress on missile defense. The details to be followed, but uh, specifically in 2006 and 7, when I became chairman of Strategic Forces, when the Democrats took the House back, we, um, we worked very closely together, not only on the funding issues, but we, we believed that we wanted to NATO-wise uh, the opportunity to have a European defense. And we also wanted to get away from the ground-based interceptors, which we thought hadn't been tested enough. And we're really about protecting the United States, not really protecting Europe. So we wanted a real uh, system that was going to be protecting Europe. And so we had invested, as the Congress, very heavily, actually took it, torqued away from what the Bush administration's recommendations were <coughs> into SM3, which presciently, you can thank Froze, Frank Bros for this, he was my chief staff at the time, um, helped us get to a place where we could really push off on SM3 uh, for both the Aegis uh, ashore and obviously the Aegis ships. But you know, I, I have tremendous respect and, and affection for Steve because I think he is a true scholar when it comes to national security issues, understands politics, uh, but is a kind of guy that delivers. And I've always appreciated working with him. Well, I've been doing missile defense for a long time and um, have, for the first 30 years, you know, Democrats and Republicans fought over it. Um, and it was, if you go back to the broad versus narrow and all these debates of the 60s and 70s, it was a very brutal time. Um, it has been refreshing that I think largely in response to world events, Democrats and Republicans now have come together in favor of missile events. And one of the reasons is people like Ellen Tauscher, who were prepared to look at it seriously and look at the world seriously and say, you know, this is something the country needs to have. <clears throat> and we'll, we can talk a little bit about, uh, about whether we think that consensus will be sustainable. But it's, a, it's also a, something I tend to say when in groups like this, that <clears throat> we've just been through a presidential campaigns, and in presidential campaigns, to the extent foreign policy figures, it's all about disagreements and differences between the parties. And then a new administration comes in, and every administration comes in by defining itself initially as not being the guys that they replaced. But when all that smoke clears and the dust settles, there's a lot more continuity in foreign policy and national security policy than people might imagine. So Ellen and I are invited to a conference in Halifax in 2009. Um, a number of you were there, Halifax Security Conference, and they put us on a panel in Iran and they think, this is going to be great. The new undersecretary of the Obama administration is really going to take on the national security advisor of the Bush administration on how different the Iran policy was. And of course, to the great disappointment of the sponsors, there was not much of a difference between no. either of us on that subject. Um, and I think it's important in this period of political stress to remember and recognize the continuity between administrations on important national security issues. It's one of the great strengths of the country. But the missile defense plan did change from one administration to another. It did, and I have <clears throat> said, I think in some sense, we in the Bush administration got it wrong. I think um, we led bilaterally, and we should have done it through NATO, and we led with um, the strategic element, the defense against strategic bliss missiles, which was about the United States, and didn't have enough <clears throat> in it about defending Europe, which was against the medium and intermediate range. And I think that's one of the reasons we had a hard time. So I think in a way, in this imperfect way our system works, and a guy like Bob Gates, who in some sense is a part of both administration, witnesses a change that, you know, while I still have some reservations about, I think on balance was the right change. And as long as we continue to invest in our own national missile defense mm -hmm. here at home, uh, it's probably the right approach, and it has gotten good support in Europe, and the reason is because I think it was a better approach from the European standpoint. So, you know, Well, how as, disappointing. As, I really would as, hoped we could push you to more greater disagreement, but we'll, we'll do this as we go on. It's pretty good for me. <laughs> um, we're, we're always a disappointment. 
<laughs> um, let me no, uh, let let me then s set the scene a little bit with uh, first of all how the system now works, the way you've seen it change over time. Um, I mean, we talked a lot about this this morning about Golden Dome and what were the percentages and how much it shot down, all that business. But I think what stuck in the minds of some of us was Jim Miller's comment that the threat is moving forward while some of what one wants to do against the threat is not is being delayed. So I, I think the question is, how does it work? And how does it work particularly in mind that, that the threat isn't going to be static? And then secondarily, how does the fiscal situation right now fit into that? Maybe, Ellen, you can start, and then Steve, step in. Yep. Well, I think the most uh, interesting thing about missile defense is that it's, um, it's like that quiz show. Uh, find a friend. You know, call a friend when you, need a, when you have a problem. Uh, missile defense is about science. It's about physics and geometry. And the interesting thing is if, you, you know, if Ian was going to shoot me, the best person to defend me is actually Steve or Fred, not myself. Uh, so no matter how much I'd go money, for the archer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go for the archer. No matter how much money you have, yeah. you still need a networked <clears throat> sensor system to <clears throat> warn you downrange where we hope your adversary, your archers are, that something's coming. And so, so there's nothing about missile defense that you really can do alone. And we think that this is one of those transformational opportunities for people to work together, not only in network systems, but also to find friends and to build regional networks uh, for both um, defenders and uh, for sensors so that you actually have real cooperation and you're starting to take down some of the old-fashioned stovepipes. So that we think that there's a lot about missile defense that is, that is new, transformational, uh, based on real math and ge you know, geometry and physics, but also you know, for p places like the GCC and other, and other places where you've got a very small physical environment, it's even more important for people to be relying on others to be able to provide you with good information and to be able to help you uh, if you should get attacked. Uh, so we've got, so far, bipartisanship. You know, we've got the sense that this is about science-based and find a friend and work together cooperatively, create these regional networks. And you know, I think the other part of it is that um, no matter how much money is, is dealt with in sequester, whether it's across the board or whether it's something discreet, um, we're going to have investments in missile defense. And we're going to keep our promises. So I think that to a certain extent, we kind of know what going forward looks like. Uh, we know what the plans are for between now and 2020. Uh, but to Fred's point, there, there is a very unconventional sense of, of what the other side is going to be doing. You know, the other side's going to get a vote. Uh, what do those archers look like? What do they actually have? What capabilities do they have? And what other unconventional <coughs> things are, are happening at the same time? And so. I think that there's a lot of understanding that we don't know enough about what the engagement will look like and how chaotic it will be, uh, but that that's another opportunity for cooperation and for people to work together to get better information. Uh, I would say that missile defense is one of the ultimate information system challenges going forward. But uh, Ellen, th this is expensive stuff, missile defense, and I'm wondering whether one of the new ideas, at least new for me, uh, this morning is that even if you're right that this is so important that the money is going to stay in the budget, it could be slowed, it could be less, while the acceleration of the threat won't, does, isn't influenced by our budget. Right. Well, that, <coughs> that's the key. You have to figure out, I would say that this is a life lesson, you have to figure out who else gets a vote. Yeah. In this case, just as the Congress interfered with the Bush administration's plans for the 10 ground-based interceptors and for the Czech radar, um, you know, the Congress could decide, as the Senate did last year, not to fund 2B. Mm -hmm. Push that out at least two years. <clears throat> and so what does that mean? So there's a lot of people with votes here. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, what is your narrative? What is your campaign? And how do you either get them to vote with you 
or find a way that their vote doesn't harm your plan. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you know, it's very important to have four like this so that people can get together. Uh, but it's also, I think, uh, a real question as to how do you get people to decide to play? And that's why these regional networks are going to be very, very important. You know, there was some discussion when, when Ambassador Alataiba was up here, you know, what goes first? You know, do we make our investments as the UAE and then everybody kind of links in? And I think you have to do these things in parallel. And of course, buying American is always a good idea. Steve? I think we ought to be past this issue of does it work? The answer right. is yes. Right. A young woman who is a friend of our daughter Kate's, married an Israeli man, lives in Israel, and in the height of the missile attacks out of Gaza, Gaza sent me an email saying, I just want to thank you and all Americans who funded Iron Dorm Dome because it's keeping Israelis alive today. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, America. Well, that's good enough for me. Um, does it work? It, yes. A uh, recent test against five simultaneous targets took out four of the five, and one of them one was the medium-range ballistic missile. It does work. It works for the threat for which it is intended, mm -hmm. which is fairly primitive ballistic missiles that North Korea and Iran can develop. Does it mean it works at the best missile that the Russians or the Chinese could throw against us? No. But it's not designed for that purpose. Does it mean we're going to have to defend the, suspend the rules of offense and defense and that we're not going to have to improve the system as the threats improve and counter, countermeasures and decoys and all this? No. We're going to have to engage in that offense-defense play the way we've had to do with every other weapon system we've ever deployed. So does it work in terms of what it's intended to do? You know, we ought to put that one aside. Uh, I agree uh, that I think it will be funded. I mean, the literature I read when people, at least before sequestration, and I don't think it'll change, there were four areas everybody said all the defense contractors were after because they were clearly going to be funded. Special forces, electronic <laughs> warfare, cyber, and missile defense. Because those are ca capabilities the country can simply not afford not to have. And if you don't believe it, you know, look at what North Korea is doing. And we don't really have a good counter for what North Korea is doing. And missile defense is going to be a critical um, component of that in terms of their nuclear and, and, and the missile program. I would that it weren't. I wish that we had options to make that problem go away altogether. I'm worried that we won't. And we're going to have to live with it. And living with it is going to require missile defense big time. Mm -hmm. So I think those issues uh, largely are behind it. And the interesting issues are, what can we make, how can we make the most of this wonderful tool, which does require you know, the village to defend any of the individual houses? What can we do with that strategically in advancing our relations uh, yeah. in places like Asia and the Middle East and Europe? Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned this morning that perhaps missile defense would work better than Dennis Rodman concerning North Korea. But joking aside, uh, North Korea in many respects in the last couple of weeks has done missile defense proponents a great favor. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, you've been in the Oval Office many times with the President of the United States giving cr crucial national security advice. <clears throat> you know, how would you address this president on the issue of missile defense, North Korea. Essentially, uh, let's go first to Asia, then we'll go to other parts of the world. Um, take a look at the scenario in Asia and how, how this current situation should play out regarding missile defense. Well, it, I mean, it won't be news to this audience, but twice the United States, once under the Bush administration, once under the Obama administration, put its national missile defense system on alert with orders from the President of the United States that authorize our military forces to use that system to shoot down the North Korea Taipo Dong 2, in each case, if it were heading towards US territory. Uh, and I can tell you, as we talked about the prospects of a North Korea missile launch, having that capacity made a huge difference for the President of the United States. There's something you can do about that challenge. 
a lot of people in this room have spent a lot of time trying to get Japan and South Korea and other countries, friends and allies in Asia, to cooperate together on defense. And it's been an, a hard go. Um, I think if my memory serves, there was an agreement on just data sharing between South Korea and Japan that we pushed very hard that six months ago was put on the shelf yet again, a data sharing. Um, the truth is that missile defense ought to be something that Japan, the United States, South Korea, and other countries ought to be able and willing to participate in together because that participation will not only share costs and expenses, but it will also improve the performance of the systems that any of them can deploy individually for the reasons that Ellen suggested. So I would say this is an enormous opportunity for to go to the South Koreans and Japanese and say, this is not about China. It is about North Korea, a threat that both of you face. So let's you know, put aside whatever disputes you have the, between the two of you, and let's get the two countries working with the United States and cooperating on ballistic missile defense as a building block for the kind of broader defense cooperation that I think would be a very good thing in that region. And that's really the potential for missile defense geopolitically to help transform and establish a new set of relations. Is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. Is it worth doing? <clears throat> Absolutely. It'd take a lot of time. Let's get after it. Let's get going. You agree, Ellen? You agree with that point? Uh, as usual, I do agree with everything Steve said. You know, <laughs> you know we, yeah. as I said earlier, find a friend. But frankly, it, the mantra should be, it takes a region. Mm -hmm. And you know we have got to, um, we've got to do two things pretty simultaneously. Which we're Americans, we can manage that. We have to uh, convince these regional actors uh, that, um, in, in a, a very quickly changing paradigm, their old fights from 75 years ago no longer matter because the technology has let past that and that they better find a friend and network themselves and find the region and define it and begin to understand where they need their sensors and how they're actually going to cooperate. The second one is we have to deal with Russia and China in a way <coughs> that, that these stabilizing deterrent systems don't become destabilizing with either of those two big actors. Uh, you know of our history of trying to convince the Russians that although capable for the current threat, Missile defenses could only, at best, chase the tail of their SLBMs or ICBMs. Um, but they're, of course, worried in the out years. And you can't ever tell someone that you want to be friendly with that they can't worry about what they're worrying about. The Chinese, difficult to engage, difficult to focus. Uh, obviously, if we get to be successful because of North Korea's, Korea's recent shenanigans, moving past the previous fights to the current future fight with Japan, with whom we have a huge, a billion dollar investment, and, and the Republic of Korea, if we can get that cooperation to begin to look, you know that the Chinese would be, consider that to be destabilizing, how they would react. We assume it would be something we would have to deal with. So I think that we have to do these things simultaneously. <coughs> Part of it is through transparency. <coughs> Part of it is through sharing data and obviously <coughs> working systems to include parts of these bigger countries. So I think the challenges are well known. Um, <coughs> it's unfortunate that in many cases uh, these future threats are actually unable to be managed in, in the right way because of past grievances. Well, let, 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 let me come back to the Chinese, <coughs> and let one follow-up on the Russians. <coughs> um, President Obama, in his famously overheard comments to uh, uh, President Medvedev, suggested that something could happen after his re-election. Uh, could you explore that for us? What might that have been, and is there something uh, that the U.S. could offer right now to, uh, to break something loose on missile defense with the Russians? Or is that now uh, uh, gone in the Putin administration? I, I want yeah. to put a caution down before yeah. Ellen yeah. answers on that. The, 
I'll tell you, one of the things that could break Republicans and Democrats on the issue of missile defense is what Republicans fear, that in order to get an agreement from the Russians for further deep reductions in our strategic forces, we would re relink strategic offense and strategic defense, a linkage that we tried to break in the Bush administration, we would relink it and accept some kind of limitations on our missile defense. That will break a partisan divide right open because some of the legislation associated with the New START Treaty says explicitly that the administration will not undertake those kinds of constraints on missile defense. So I think how we handle this issue uh, with the Russians is important. And Alan, why don't you talk a bit about that? And then Fred, let's come back if we could to yeah. the China question. Which yeah, I, I think will. Is, yeah. We might get some good reactions from people here on. Yeah. Well, um, Ellen Tauscher from the New START Treaty and Ellen Tauscher from the Mutually Assured Stability Conversations and Missile Defense Conversations with Russia is still the same person. And there's no, there was no linkage between anything in New START or anything in future arms control uh, with missile defense with Russia because we don't, frankly, need to bend back that far. Uh, as we said, we're, we're dealing with science, geometry, and physics. And you know whether the Russians want to believe it or want to actually acknowledge it publicly, there's even, even a high school math student or a physics student can understand that our uh, capable but limited system is not one that does anything to threaten the strategic deter the strategic forces of the of the Russian uh, government? So, you know, we say it all the time. We talk about it, but the po the point really is, uh, the Russians believe that these things are inextricably linked, and because your negotiating partner believes they're linked, they're linked. And you know, the Congress can say, well, you're not going to link those things. Uh, there's nothing this president is ever going to do to diminish the national security and the capabilities of us to protect ourselves, our own assets, our forward deployed troops, and keep our agreements. But there are optics issues, and Steve's very, very right. Um, <clears throat> and some of my former colleagues on the Hill who don't take their medication on time always want to project a sense of paranoia about what we might do, <coughs> um, even, if, even if we couldn't do it if we wanted to. So I think the question is, you know, how do you manage these very delicate things at a time where you've also got tremendous <coughs> pressures on the budget. And a lot of uh, legislation, the only legislating going on apparently among my foreign, foreign colleagues is to say, you haven't thought of doing this, but don't you dare do that and let's all pass it. And so, <coughs> it, you know, this is not enabling legislation, this is disabling legislation. So there's a lot about this that is unfortunate. But in the end, you know, we still have to get to the core issue of how do you create, uh, how do we take a technology advantage? How do we maintain it? How do we have more predictability in the channel so for investments and we have a sense that these things are going to happen? How do we deal with making sure that we have burden sharing among our allies and friends? And even though, by American pleas, we still have indigenous capabilities among many of our allies that we want them to continue to invest in and have uh, interoperability with Alt-BMD or whatever system uh, you know, goes into the Gulf states or whatever goes into, the, into Asia that's part of, of Japan. So I think that there's a bunch of this that is um, hard to predict. But for the Russian piece, we've, we have asserted constantly this is not a, a, any kind of threat to the Russians. Um, I think that we have to get ourselves to a place. You know, the President will be meeting with Mr. Putin a couple of times this year. Uh, what the President said We've all had an open mic at some time in our life. What the president said was so innocent and, and so easily translated to mean almost anything. Um, I think it only meant what it meant to people because that's what they wanted it to mean. And you know, the idea that you've got a new president, you've gone through a tough campaign in Russia, we're, we're, we're going through a political campaign that uh, where things kind of grind to a halt the idea that you look beyond your getting your second term and say, I can't wait to get back together with you. Maybe we can get something done. I don't find it to be nefarious or sinister. I think it's, I think it's a good thing. I think that we do want to have a, a missile defense agreement so that we can go forward on other kinds of, 
of agreements, including arms control, yeah. uh, but we're not going to be trading them in any way or diminishing our own capabilities in order to get them. And, and President Obama did never mention the number 47 percent in that overhead comment. <laughs> but the, um, That's the, as good a defense see, I of President get... Obama's comment as you can possibly ever get. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Thank the, you. Uh, Very well the, by, by the way, <clears throat> bipartisanship at the Atlantic Council has never meant that people, in fact, it means the debate, we'd like to have the debate in our house, uh, but it certainly doesn't mean one doesn't make uh, comments of, of disagreement on often and frequently uh, uh, the better. Um, the, uh, because that's the way you reach consensus to achieve policy outcomes. Steve, one question that I'm going to go to the audience, and that's on China since you raised yep. it. Um, why not have a deeper conversation with China right. on missile defense? It certainly <clears throat> would get the Kremlin's interest. Uh, it, it, it's one of the one of the benefits, of course, <clears throat> it would be. One, it, to put the question the Chinese it would really be a difficult one for them to answer, and it would certainly get the uh, Indian, the uh, the uh, Russians' interest. But there, are, I've been sort of thinking about it, and I think the situations are really not really symmetrical. Right. One of the reasons we went to talk to the Russians about missile defense was because the Europeans wanted us to do it, right. and our belief was that the Europeans would be more willing to enter into the project that if it could be done with Russia rather than against Russia, or at least made a good faith effort to give Russia an opportunity to participate. And that's what and Ellen that's has still done. True, right? And that's still true. Our allies in Asia, I suspect, and we can have some people comment on this, don't see it the same way. It's partly because uh, they're, they feel threatened by an emerging China in a way that the Europeans do really not feel protected by the post-Soviet Russia that is to, to there feel today. Threatened, but they, the, they don't feel threatened by the... They do not. The, yeah. Our allies in Asia <laughs> feel threatened yeah. by an emerging China, whereas our allies in Europe really do not feel threatened yeah. by the post-Soviet Russia today. That's a good thing mm -hmm. for Russians and Europeans. Um, second of all, you can say to the Russians, this is about... Iran, defending against Iran, and Iran is potentially a threat to you. The Russians have trouble admitting that because they don't want to alienate Iran. They may not really believe it, so the Russians say, well, it could be about Iran, but it could be about Pakistan, it could be about a number of countries in that region of instability, and that's good enough. You go to the Chinese and you say, well, this is about a missile attack from potentially North Korea, and Chinese have two problems. One, they don't worry about a missile attack from North Korea. They really don't. And secondly, it's a lot harder for them to say, to do anything that suggests North Korea is an adversary. That's one of the problems we're having of getting the Chinese to cooperate with us against North Korea. Because while they don't want a nuclear North Korea, they want even less a North Korea that collapses on their border. So anything that sort of draws a line between North Korea and China of this sort, I think is not likely to work. And uh, it will not be, I think, reassuring to the South Koreans and the Japanese that we want to involve the Chinese in some kind of cooperative missile defense. It's just not how they see it. And there are all other, all other, there are other countries will then ask the question. So what will the Indians think about that if the United States says we ought to have missile defense cooperation with China? What does that mean about it'll probably accelerate missile defense cooperation between the United States and India? That would be a good thing. But I just don't see that it is needed, mm -hmm. and I don't think strategically it would be wise in terms of our relations in the region. And thirdly, I think it's something the Chinese cannot possibly pick up for all kinds of reasons, and even the Russians, who we've been working with on missile defense cooperation, you know, since 1990, we've been trying to get the Russians to agree on missile defense cooperation over 20 years, and we still can't get them to yes. The idea that we could work out something that would make sense with the Chinese that they could accept, I just think it's not in the yeah. cards, mm -hmm. and probably not in our interests. Right. <coughs> Questions? <coughs> Please. <clears throat> Do you agree with that? Pardon me? 
Do you agree with that? I do absolutely agree. With that. First, thanks for a really terrific uh, <clears throat> discussion. Uh, the other side of uh, defense, of course, is deterrence. And given the fact that uh, we have adversaries such as North Korea and Iran and uh, religious fanatics, um, is the concept of deterrence, as we've known it during the Cold War, dead? And what, if anything, can replace it? Well, it's interesting. Is the concept of deterrence as we've known it in the Cold War dead? Maybe. Maybe it's a little different. Is the concept of deterrence dead? Not at all. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's always been, I thought, one of the most interesting arguments for missile defense was that it was also, it was viewed by a lot of people as missile defense was the antithesis of deterrence. Um, and, of course, its advocates in the 90s came up with an argument. It's a different kind of deterrence. It's deter by denial of objective. Right. So you deter not by saying, if you attack me, I'm going to blow you to smithereens. You say, go ahead and attack me if you want, but I'm going to tell you, and I have the capacity to deny your ability to achieve your objectives. So why do you want to throw all your money in that program in the first place? And that's one of the deterrence contributions of defense. So I think, uh, of, of missile defense. So I think deterrence is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way of affecting people's calculation and affecting people's behavior. Is it alive and well in the 21st century? You bet. Do we have to think about how we can deter more effectively in the context in which I find, we find ourselves? Absolutely. Does that mean we're going to have concepts and vehicles for deterrence that are going to look a little different than it did in the 20th century? Probably. Yeah, I, I think Steve's right. I, I think that. <coughs> but deterring the, Ellen, deterring the, individu the, the rogue individual is not the same as deterring a state actor. No. But, but there's, you know, or, or keep it. Or a non-state uh, terrorist group. That's right. I, I mean, I don't know what you do to deter Hezbollah. Uh, but I do know that if you do, if it is about a regional cooperative agreement, you would assume that there's more to the agreement than just send me the sensor data or, you know, if something comes toward me, you get the first shot. There's probably a lot more about that agreement that includes mutual aid. And, and, and mutual offense should one of that group get attacked. And so that, bu that builds up deterrence to a different piece because our, still, our Achilles heel is still rate size. You know, over a certain number, you, we're gonna, you know, this very good system will be overwhelmed. But if you have a regional network, all of a sudden now raid size has a different dimension because I'm not, me versus you, I'm six, so you multiply by six, or seven, or 10, or in the case of NATO, 27, 28, the people that are gonna come to my defense. So it's a different kind of deterrence. Steve's right, it's a 21st century type of, it, and it's, it's, it's like in the computer world, d denial of service. This is denial of your, your attack. And you know, it's a different kind of concept. We, we have to continue to push it a bit, but I think it's, it's successful. And I think in some issues, we've got to stay with some 21st century, 20th century concept. I'll tell you, on cyber, we've tried to deter by, saying, by making our systems hard against attack, and it's inadequate. And I think what's happening to our systems, whether from the Chinese government or others, will not stop right. until in the cyber arena, we can affect, affect offensively a cost on their cyber systems that changes their cost-benefit trades. Because for the moment, there's no penalty That's that right. is being paid. It's all gain, no pain. And all you get is Tom Donnan doing his best by saying publicly, this is a bad thing that's coming from China, and we raise it with Chinese at every level of government. Good. But that's not going to stop it. Mm -mm. It's not going to stop until we can deter it by offensively imposing a cyber cost on cyber intrusion, I think. I see, I see a question in the back and then up here. Sorry. Uh, Bill Jones, Executive Intelligence Review. 
Um, regarding, I'd like to go back to the Russian uh, opposition, the Russian, uh, the problems we're having with Russia to cooperate on this system. About a year ago, a gentleman whom you both know or acquainted with, uh, Mr. Dmitry Rogozin, went to NATO and suggested that the uh, two sides, that is NATO and Russia, work together on a system that he called the strategic defense of Earth to protect the Earth against uh, astro asteroids and uh, meteorites. Uh, his proposal uh, was met uh, really with silence. Uh, nobody really took it seriously. They figured it's just another one of these statements by Rogozin. But of course, with the uh, events in Chelyabinsk now, uh, this has become a, uh, a question for everybody. And it, of course, it has been reiterated by Mr. Rogozin and taken up by uh, Prime Minister Medvedev as well uh, to create a system of global protection against uh, meteorites and, and asteroids. And of course, you're dealing with the same type of technologies that you would be dealing with in the original Reagan proposal of the SDI, the space-based assets and things like that to detect, to find, and to th uh, thwart the uh, potential. Uh, isn't this at least an opening uh, that if it were accepted by the United States, the idea of cooperating with Russia and other countries on this type of a system would probably create the kind of climate where a lot of this uh, paranoia or whatever it is, the fears would uh, be subsided. Uh, Alan, you were negotiating with the Russians on related topics. Did this ever come up? No, it didn't. But, you know, Dmitry Rogozin is, is a, <laughs> it got promoted uh, to deputy prime minister for that. So, uh, you know, I think, I, I believe any chance that you have to, to open a, a a space at the negotiating table where you can talk about things that you uh, can cooperate on is a good thing. Um, but I think that at the same time, nothing about what, what uh, the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister Medvedev and Rogozin are talking about changes what the Russian military believes uh, is their paradigm for their way of doing business uh, that causes them to viciously dislike missile defense. And, you know, they, they just look at the facts. They don't look at it as geometry and physics. They've decided to make it that this is going to uh, deeply undercut their strategic forces. That's their story. They're sticking to it. And I don't care if we cooperated on asteroid finding and gold mining on asteroids or whatever we were going to do. I don't think that's going to change their position in the short term. Uh, but I'm, you know, I like to cooperate uh, as best I can. So I think opening a channel and talking about that is not a bad thing. But I don't, I'm not going to be fooled to think it's yeah. going to change their mind <coughs> in the short term. I think that's right. Okay, let me take another. <coughs> nice. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey Lin from Senator Angus King's office. As you know, the Chinese tested another mid-course missile defense. Uh, back January of this year. The first one was about two years ago, I believe. So what implications would Chinese development of missile defense technology have both for their strategic intentions as well as proliferating around the world? Well, you know, I think, I think that uh, we would just like to have better transparency of the Chinese of what they're doing, both on their strategic nuclear forces and uh, other forms of, of the deterrent, including missile defense. Um, you know, it was a frustrating part of my job that I got to see the Chinese fairly often in P5 environment, but really never really got to understand what exactly their plans were and what they were going to do. Um, and that's disappointing because we, we need to know more about what they're doing. You know, if we got ourselves into a place where we were discussing with the Russians, you know, some more um, strategic deployed and non-deployed arms control, if we're ever going to get to a multilateral version of it, we need to have the Chinese be prepared to, to play in that game. And it doesn't seem to me that they're really interested at all. I think our position generally ought to be missile defenses are good things. Yeah. They allow countries to defend themselves. So is it bad that China is investing in missile defense? I would say no. Mm -hmm. uh, does it sometimes cause people to misunderstand strategic intentions? Yes. So if you're going to invest in missile defense, you ought to do it in a transparent way so that your neighbors can 
can see it and not be alarmed by it. Uh, I don't know why, I, I'm not sure what the Chinese rationale is for missile defense. I can understand, for example, why Taiwan would like missile defense yeah. given the 1,000 to 1,200 Chinese <laughs> ballistic missiles that are aimed at Taiwan. I don't quite know what the rationale for the Chinese program is, but I think our view ought to be getting in the business of defending oneself is a good thing, but in order to reassure people, particularly if your country is like China and the United States, you ought to do it in a transparent way. Mm -hmm. <coughs> See a question. I saw one in the back here, please. Yeah. I'll go to people as I've seen them, so I think we have time uh, for a couple you. more questions. Tom Colino, Arms Control Association. Thank you both very much for being here. Uh, you both have a wealth of experience dealing with the United States government, Congress, also with Russia and on missile defense. I think he just told me I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that was not Tom, my intent. I know Tom <laughs> thinks I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Uh, but my question is... Um, I am, that's all right. Given that, that large experience... That's great. Uh, and, and the current uh, situation that the president finds himself in, where he's trying to negotiate another round of reductions with Russia, uh, but missile defense, and particularly phase four of the EPAA, is causing problems. How would you, again, given this large experience, how would you approach that problem given what we know now, and specifically I'm asking about uh, how might you deal with the SM32B, given funding uh, issues, uh, what Jim Miller said this morning, uh, technology uh, setbacks and the rest. What is the way forward on this that you think might work? Thank you. Which one of you wants to tackle that? See? Well, I, <clears throat> <clears throat> I, I would certainly keep pressing with the SM3 2B, uh, you know, it's an uncertain world out there, and I think we may need it. Um, I think there are a lot of things that Ellen tried to do to reassure the Russians. You know, at some point, in order to be, to reassure the Russians, the Russians have to be willing to be reassured on the merits. And that's the question Ellen put on the table, and given her experience, she's not sure they are. Um, there, you know, this is a tricky business, and people said, well, one thing you do to, the, to reassure the Russians is you have a statement that, you know, the U.S. system is not directed at Russia in any way, shape, or form, and does not threaten the Russian strategic deterrent or Russian national security. And I think about that, and I sort of say, well, you know, not a legally binding statement like that. Yeah, that's probably okay. And then I think about, you know, this shows the dilemma we're in. Um, you know, Russia is continuing to modernize its own strategic nuclear deterrent. It is building new missiles and doing other things. So should we get a statement from the Russians that their offensive modernization program is not directed at and does not threaten the United States of America in any way? And if they gave it to us, would we believe it? I mean, you know, there is this problem of the Russians, you know, making this insistence on missile defenses while they maintain an offensive nuclear weapons modernization program that's directed at the United States. So, you know, so, you know I, I think these are difficult issues. In the end of the day, would I accept, you know, do I think the United States could accept some kind of fig leaf statement like that? Probably. Um, if it was the price of making sure that we could pursue what we need to do to defend ourselves and our friends and allies against ballistic missile defense. Um, but I think there is, in most sectors for Republicans and Democrats, there's a consensus that we should not constrain our missile defense yes. efforts. Yes. And I think that's right, given the uncertainty of the world in which we're, we're living. And I think the other thing, which will be not popular here and not popular with your organization, I, I think we have the enthusiasm for ever lower levels of strategic nuclear forces was generated in a world, you know, that was sort of last, of, of sort of 10 years ago. And I really wonder whether we've done a step back look of the world in which we are in. And you know, cyber vulnerabilities and command and control vulnerabilities and what that means about our own strategic forces. I just, 
I just have this feeling that the world has started to change around us about the kinds of threats. And that we've sort of, the mindset by which, and I was part of this, you know, I was part of Start One and Start Two, you know, I'm a two time uh, offender. But I just think the world has changed. I wonder whether we've got, you know, people stepping back and saying this treadmill of sort of further reductions on strategic nuclear forces for all the reasons we've pursued in the past, whether that's still right or whether the world uh, is a different place uh, in terms of what other countries are doing in terms of vulnerabilities and all the rest. I, I just... I just think we need to get off the treadmill and do a strategic relook. You know, I, uh, <coughs> after we got the, <coughs> the New START Treaty uh, negotiated, it was, it was actually uh, three years ago, right around this time, that, that I was in Geneva and uh, with not enough clothes. And then we went to, uh, the president took us to uh, Prague and we signed it in early April. And then we had to, the tough job of trying to figure out how to get it ratified in an election year with an <coughs> inevitable lame duck Congress. And of course, we did. Um, we, we actually strategically decided, uh, this administration, to, to move the talks from the head-to-head -head bang bang of arms control to what we called mutually assured stability. We had this very long period of mutually assured st dis uh, destruction. Uh, the end of the Cold War, and, and the, my question to the Russians is, how do you define our relationship? How do you define your ambitions? How do you define where we, where we see ourselves? And, and what, are, what are the opportunities for us to cooperate? We came up with a baker's dozen of issues, and many of them are obvious, you know, including arms control, missile defense, nonproliferation, you know, cyber, lots of things that are out there to begin to, to say, let's not just have the same conversation all over again about, you know, well, how many do you think you should have, and what about strategic, and what about non-strategic, what about deployed, non-deployed. Let's talk about the relationship, and let's define it, and let's create a destination for ourselves. Hmm. So we leave the world of mutually assured destruction, and we go to a world called mutually assured stability. Are we best friends? BFFs? No. But are we cooperating on a ton of things? Hopefully some of this Baker's dozen? Yeah. And do we have a way to not have somebody fritzing out, you know, across the street and creating a problem for us, whether it's Syria or Libya? Do we have a way to have more predictability in the relationship so that we know that we can get past the last indiscretion of who knows who? And so these talks are, I think, the fundamental opportunity for us to not be so transactional because arms control is an element of a bigger conversation. And so how do you get to it without <coughs> constantly banging on it and get to it in other ways and build a sense of understanding, predictability, cooperation, stability in a way that you can get past the inevitable food fight that happens either by one side or the other or a third party, you know, creating a problem. And that is a mature relationship. It's a mature relationship where you don't have to agree all the time, where you can cooperate, where you can be having a fight on the fourth floor and giving each other a check on the third floor and working on things like Iran and other problems mm -hmm someplace else in the building. So that's where I think we have the best opportunity. Um, the Atlanta Council, uh, you okay. want to talk about what we're going to do, but we're going to do some track two talks because right now we're, for lots of reasons, some of them mostly rushed, Russian, you know, the, the, the environment um, is not as it was when Medvedev was president, frankly. So, yeah. you know, I think that there's a lot about this that's, a, that's just to try to keep things going. But we've got very, very good people in the government, and, uh, and these are talks that both Republicans and Democrats have with, uh, with Russians that are out of government. So, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to go forward. Yeah, we certainly think that. Uh, let me take one last, we're down to our last three, four minutes. Uh, Leo, uh, one last question here. I know there were several <coughs> other hands up. I apologize, I can't get to everyone. 
Thanks. Uh, Leo Michel, National Defense University. You mentioned burden sharing. And um, as it discussed earlier, uh, at the uh, Chicago summit last May, there were at least several Europeans who pressed for some somewhat restrictive language on the missile defense section on what would be covered by common funding. And when you compare what NATO was agreed to, or at least has a, an estimate for common funding, it's a relatively small amount compared to what the United States will be spending not only for the uh, development, but also for the deployment and the, uh, the sustainment of Aegis and eventually the ground-based systems. Um, I've heard some Europeans say, well, once we accept that missile defense is necessary and part uh, uh, of our requirements, the United States next year, or the, at least the U.S. Congress, will press for us to pay much more of the bill. Do you expect that, particularly given the current and the foreseeable fiscal environment, that we're going to have uh, more pressures from Congress uh, in the not too distant future to, to look at missile defense and say, is this an equitable sharing of the burden? Since, as you rightfully point out, you shifted the system to do more to emphasize defense of Europe, not just defense of the United States. So, Alan, maybe you can take that as your last question. I would like to pose the last question to Steve in a way to let the audience come into a conversation uh, we had outside on the GCC in Israel. Uh, and my final question to Steve after you answer the NATO question is uh, under the heading of the enemy of the enemy is my friend, could you imagine a GCC Israeli cooperation of some sort on missile defense? So, Ellen. Um, do we want our European allies, uh, especially our NATO allies, to spend more, not to go from crashing down from less than 2% to 1% to less than 1% in, in national security and defense? Yes. Do I expect that, that it will be about missile defense? No. Uh, we, have, we have said that our national contribution is going to be the system that's going to be bolted into the <coughs> all-BMD system. And um, you know, we, we already have, certainly up until 18, we, we pretty much have in the FIDEP, the money is, is tracking to do everything we said we were going to do. Not a bad thing. Um, you know, the four Aegis are going to Rota. You're going to have Romania. You've already got Turkey. And you're going to, going to have Poland. Um, so I think the question really isn't about missile defense. I don't think my European <laughs> friends should be concerned that we're going to be banging on them for more money for burden sharing about missile defense. About everything else, you bet. Um, nobody's sort of gotten more operational development uh, experience with missile defense than the Israelis, admittedly in the short to medium range, and I guess the Aero program will get close to the intermediate range. Um, so does it make sense uh, if you were concerned about missile defense threats in the Middle East for the GCC, the United States, and Israel all to cooperate together? Absolutely. It would make great sense. Is it going to happen <laughs> in, in my lifetime? <clears throat> Probably not. If we had gotten an Israeli, if the United States, through its efforts of many administrations, had gotten an Israeli-Palestinian agreement, which was embedded in an Israeli-Arab world reconciliation, which is really what we've been trying as a nation for 20, 30 years to do on many administrations, you know, then you could begin to talk about those kinds of things. But I think in the current politics of the day, when the, the thing everybody's worried about is Iran, for the GCC to do anything that's explicitly associated with Israel is a card that they will never want to give to the Iranians and that the Iranians would use in the Arab street against them. So, um, you know, whether there's something below the table and below the radar screen, I don't know. But in, in terms of a, uh, something in a formal way, probably not going to happen. Thank, thank you, Steve. So uh, just to close, uh, before you go to your short uh, coffee break uh, before the next, the next panel, which is on a U.S. Missile Defense Initiative in the Asia Pacific, uh, I just want to thank both Ellen and Steve 
Um, not just for this really fascinating conversation with what, what brilliant minds, but also for your uh, service uh, to um, your public service and service to the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you.